Good afternoon to all. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Cutolo and Emanuele Cotelli from the Working Group on Education to organize these educational webinars. And today we have the honor to have two experts on juvenile systemic cirrhosis with us. The first expert is Ivan Fultvari. He's the head of the Hamburg Center of Pediatric and Adolescent Rheumatology, the lead PI of the Juvenile Scleroderma Inception Cohort and lead of the SETC Juvenile Scleroderma Working Group on Juvenile Systemic Cirrhosis. He will speak to us about the share recommendations for treatment of juvenile systemic cirrhosis and compare them with the treatment in the inception cohort. And he will also give us the update on the recommendations for juvenile systemic cirrhosis treatment, which have been published recently. Please, Ivan, take the floor. Thank Vanessa for the invitation and thank Mauricio for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon and that you are interested in juvenile systemic scleroderma, which is shown in the first slide is a real orphan disease with a prevalence of a three to four in one million children. These are data <clears throat> based on the US claim database. First of all, I would like to introduce the juvenile scleroderma inception cohort because a lot of the data is are drawn from that. This is a cohort where prospectively we follow patients who have juvenile systemic scleroderma fulfilling the adult classification criteria, develop the first non reno before the age of 16, and they are under the age of 18 when they are included. And we assess them every six months with a standardized organ assessment, and we look for patient and physician-related outcomes at the same time point. Um, I would like to thank all colleagues who are supporting their cohort, because without of their support and help, we could not have this data collection for this really orphan disease. This is not a map of the um, more the centers who are contributing, and you see 62% <clears throat> of the patients are coming from Europe. Um, the first topic is the juvenile systemic sclerosis treatment in an international cohort comparing to the recent share to the share recommendations. The share recommendations are actually based uh, on a data collection and publication collection from 2014. So they are not really so updated. And here actually we introduced this talk at the ACR. Um, currently, no medication is licensed for the treatment of juvenile systemic scleroderma due its rarity. Only recently have the first treatment guidelines published. That was the SHARE guideline, uh, which was published actually uh, 221 in rheumatology. Um, we looked in this evaluation, the frequency of medication in general category and specific medication was calculated across the cohort of the time points, time point zero, 12 and 24 months. And we included only patients who had at least 12 months follow-up. These results we compared to the share recommendation, see if the practicing physician who put in patients in the cohort are really practicing according the guideline. Uh, interestingly, we had some patients who had no medication. Some of them could be explained. Actually, it was at the recent World Scleroderma Congress. There were even more patients in the USTA registry who did not medication. It was like 40%. And here we have only like 5 to 8% who have no medication. Some of these patients can be that the physician suggested the medication, but actually the patient took some alternative drugs which are not listed on our list. So therefore, they are not taking medications. Uh, if we look at corticosteroid use, interestingly, that's a pediatric specialty. There are a lot of patients who are getting corticosteroids with 50% time point zero and 44% time point 24. And this could be explained that we have around 30% of the patients with overlap features, mostly with myositis, and this is the first choice of treatment for myositis. Um, and actually in the share recommendation in skin involvement, it is suggested to give corticosteroids at the beginning within a combination for DMARDs. If you look at DMARDs, you see that around 61% received the monotherapy and it stayed at the same thing. The most common DMARD was methotrexate with 56%. And it drops down actually interestingly to 30% over the time. And the other most common DMARD was uh, mycophenolate. 
And here you see a comparison of the patients at time point zero and 12 months who are receiving methotrexate and mycophenolate. And we wanted to look, is there any characteristic where we see the difference why who receive mycophenolate or methotrexate? And you can see that actually patient mycophenolate had more severe disease scores according to the patient-related outcomes as a physician-related outcomes and the drug score. Biodemarts were used not so frequently, but this is uh, a collection of data from 2008. So I think it is increasing. But at time point 24, we had like 70% of the patient received the biodemart. Most common bio biologic demart was tocilizumab with 14% followed was rituximab, which would be actually reflect what the share recommended. And it reflects actually the current use in adults too, where tocilizumab and rituximab are the most commonly used biologics. If you look at autologous stem cell transplantation, we have only one patient in this evaluation. We have even now more patients who have autologous stem cell transplantation. And it is overlapping with the share recommendation where it is suggested as a treatment option. If you look at um, endothelial receptor antagonists and PDE5 blockers, you see that it is used at the endothelial receptor antagonist around 16 to 20%, and the PDE5 blockers around 5 to 9%. And around actually, it, it reflects the patients who have reno, who have pulmonary hypertension is around 6%, and who have severe, I think we have patient with ulceration who are around 20%. So actually, this is quite fitting with the share recommendation too, where it is suggested that patients with pulmonary hypertension and digital ulceration should receive these drugs. In summary, for this part, this is the first evaluation looking at clinical medication practice pattern in juvenile systemic scleroderma and its comparison to recently published consensus guidelines. It shows a high overlap between consensus-based recommendation and clinical practice. This study looked not at the efficacy of the medication because of legal problems to assess of label medication prospectively in several European countries or other countries who contributed data. If I go to the second part of the talk, I just wanted to show how this medication works. And here we looked at the 24 months data in the systemic scleroderma cohorts, how it, the organ involvement changes. And here we reviewed the patients and looked after 24 months, and the data is drawn till the 1st of September 2022. And you see, this is a characteristic, the juvenile cohort that we have over around 70% diffused patients, which is different from adults. And the female male ratio is top four to one. And you can clearly see that with the medication, what we are using, and you saw what we are using, the modified non run skin score significantly decreased, which is a very good news. If you look at other organ moments, they are actually quite stable beside joint pain, which is increased significantly and muscle weakness. We, I have to emphasize that we have no patient with renal crisis and most renal involvement is proteinuria. Um, and if you look at patient reported outcome, we have very good news that in all patient reported outcomes, what we assessed, global disease activity, this is damage, renal activity, and ulceration activity, we could show a significant decrease of the activity. If you look at physician reported outcome, you could see that the physician global disease activity and ulceration activity significantly decreased over 24 months. So that's actually a quite good news. And the third topic, because we just have 20 minutes, so therefore um, it's all quite short, um, I want to introduce our new treatment guidance. And actually this was done because the share recommendation, what I referenced before comparing our treatment in the inception cohort is the literature search is up till 214. So we have done a consensus meeting in Hamburg, updating this and reviewing the current literature and looking if we can make a more comprehensive treatment guidance because the share is looking just some organ systems and this guidance, what we wanted to create it, looked at each organ system. So here you see the members of the group who are all cropped were in the room and discussed heavily. And there were multidisciplinary experts who came to Hamburg. They were adults and pediatric rheumatologists and other subspecialties. 
and data were extracted from the juvenile inception court regarding clinical outcomes and um, the treatments. We discussed the extent, the adult data, how far they can be extrapolated to the juvenile patients and its limitation. And in a consensus meeting, we formulated, based on nominal group technique, a guidance regarding the treatment. 80% agreement was needed for each recommendation. Professor Dan First from UCLA in Los Angeles was the moderator at this meeting. Um, here you see the group in the room, how they are watching the discussion. And the goal was to provide a standardized comprehensive treatment approach, which is both mostly disciplinary, interdisciplinary for best care for juvenile systemic scleroderma. And the pediatric rheumatology treat to target concept was introduced too, that you want to have a treatment escalation after three to six months if the treatment did not reach the aim. And the aim is inactive disease. And actually we said always that pediatric outcome measures should be used if it's possible, what we published from this meeting in Hamburg years before in the arthritis care and therapy. And this is the, if you want to read our paper in detail, then please go to this paper. It is now published recently. And I would like to thank again to all participants who came to Hamburg and support the workshop because we don't have so much sufficient support. So they have really had their own input. Um, so all the overarching principles, I can't get into detail for all recommendation, but I wanted to show you the overarching principles like all children with juvenile system scleroderma should be referred to a specialized medical clinical care center who is familiar with scleroderma and has access to a multidisciplinary care. It is aimed to get the disease under control so the child can continue to grow and develop, improve quality of life and prevent damage. And standardized or outcome measures should be used. And here's the reference, what we published in 223 in Antarctic Care of Research. But like for example, the general treatment concept, systemic corticosteroids in combination from DMARTs are useful in anti-active inflammatory phase. Initiation of treatment with DMARTs and physical therapy should not be delayed. And DMARTs commonly used to treat juvenile system scleroderma include methotrexate, mycophenolate, and cyclophosphamide. In case of insufficient response to therapy, change or additional therapy is recommended. And um, here's the treat to Tartman concept, and you escalate basically it depending on the different health systems. You can combine metotrexate with mycophenolate, by it's a presumably a better option, uh, adding a biologic therapy like tocilizumab or rituximab. Autologous bone marrow transplantation should be considered as an option. And actually, we had a consensus meeting in 223 where we developed a guidance for the autologous bone marrow transplantation. And hopefully it will publish in the same journal as the guidance before. We just have to submit the paper till end of June. We are all working on this heavily. Um, and these are the tables. What you can see in the paper, I won't get into the detail, but the main concept is you have always a first line treatment, second line treatment, third line treatment, and you have a supportive treatment, what we are suggesting. And this is the difference you have really for every organ system, this kind of treatment, skin arthritis, myositis, renal crisis, renal phenomenon, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, and GI moment. So this paper is really very comprehensive. So in conclusion, a diverse group of international juvenile system is called the expert with adult expert made a treatment recommendation for general guidance and for all organ systems. Many recommendations were extrapolated from adult systemic scleroderma with pediatric context. Both supportive care measures and medical therapies were recommended for each individual organ involvement. Implementation of the recommendation should lead to overall better outcome. And here you see the group and the, some part of the group at the end of the meetings, some already left. I really would like to invite you if you have a patient with juvenile system is scleroderma, that you contribute this patient for this project because every patient count. Now we have over around 270 patients and how more the patients we have, the better the data quality is and we can learn more about the organ movement and all the issues what we are really interested in. And I would like to thank for your interest that you listen to this. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ivan, for your very nice presentation. Before we get into questions, I would like to ask Eduardo to give his lecture and then we will take questions 
to both of you. In the end, I would also like to inform you that these presentations will also be on YouTube through the Erin channel, I think about one week from now. Thank you so much again, Ivan, and stay with us because we will have questions for you after Eduardo gives his lecture. Eduardo is a pediatric rheumatologist from Aue Meyer in Firenze. He's the lead of training and education pillar within the Scleroderma working group of the press. Dear Eduardo, please explain to us the difference between adults and children with systemic cirrhosis. Sure. Good, uh, more, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ivan, can you please uh, stop? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, yes. Eduardo, <laughs> all yours. <laughs> So, thank you, everyone. This is uh, uh, just a reminder that the webinar was the idea of this webinar was born uh, to celebrate the World Young Rheumatic Disease Day, who was uh, uh, held the 18th of March. And uh, so, this is uh, why I'm so uh, I need to thank um, Vanessa and uh, Ivan Folvari for, uh, uh, for the idea of this uh, webinar. I will uh, talk in a, in a brief about the um, trying to make a comparison between adult and juvenile uh, systemic sclerosis. Um, as already told by um, Dr. Foelvari, uh, juvenile systemic sclerosis is uh, an orphan disease. Uh, it represents 0.2 till the 10th percent of all the uh, scleroderma patients, and uh, um, the rarity of the disease it's uh, associated with a, a, a diagnostic delay, delay and a, a potential worse prognosis in these patients. As uh, already told, there are no licensed medication, neither uh, clinical trial run specifically for juvenile systemic sclerosis patients. Uh, so there is a, a huge need of uh, research in this field as uh, this is the most severe rheumatic disease in childhood. Uh, I show you the prognosis later on in this presentation, but uh, five, the mortality rates is 5% at, at uh, five years. Um, from a pediatric point of view, what I need to underline there is these few important differences between pediatric patients and adult patients. Um, uh, just uh, the first point is a failure to try in a, a growing um, subject is always a concern um, as we expect our patients to grow up over time. This is why it's so important in our patients with the juvenile sclerosis to assess body, uh, body mass index regularly as uh, uh, undergrow or scant grow, it's uh, is still a concern in, uh, uh, in a high um, percentage of patients in our, in our clinic. And the second point is that stable values in a growing individual mean a lack of, of improvement. This is particularly true if we think about a pulmonary function test. Uh, we expect the value to grow up with a, a, in, according to the growth of a, the child. If we get two stable measurements in one year in a growing subject, this means that the lung involvement is getting worse. So a key message I want to give to all my adult uh, uh, colleagues is uh, in children, the change in the dynamic are more valuable, valuable than a single measurement. Uh, just to, uh, I will pre present shortly uh, some data, um, just to make a comparison between uh, um, the, uh, our population, the pediatric population, uh, with data provided by Dr. Foelvari from juvenile uh, systemic sclerosis in Champion Court, and the data collected for adult uh, scleroderma patients in the uh, SPIN project. It's uh, a multinational project um, for, for adult patients with uh, adult scleroderma. Uh, the first main difference is, is the type of uh, scleroderma we are looking at. Uh, in uh, juvenile patients, we have a 
in higher uh, percentage of patients presenting with a diffuse subtype. This is uh, the contrary when, uh, uh, when we look uh, at the adults where most of the patients has a limited form of the disease. Uh, another point to consider is that the female to male ratio is uh, um, it's a reduced in diffuse subtype juvenile scler systemic sclerosis as uh, um, most of the patients, I mean, a high percentage of patients with diffuse uh, subtype in prepuberal um, subjects are male. So this is why the ratio is not so high as expected for, uh, for um, adult patients. Uh, when you look at the uh, out-antibody status, uh, we see that the uh, anti-centromer antib antibodies are not so frequent in our population with a percentage who is uh, 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 2% in the diffuse subtype, uh, and, uh, but is still low even in the limited juvenile subtype with uh, its 12% in, in uh, the screen chapter code, while the uh, anti-topoisomerase uh, uh, antibodies or frequency of uh, anti-PMSGL uh, for overlap syndrome is uh, comparable between uh, um, adult and uh, pediatric patients. Uh, just to say that in, in the inception court, there is a, a limited number of overlap syndrome, but in other courts, there are pre historical court, there is a higher number of uh, overlap syndrome. Um, mm. When we look at cutaneous and vascular involvement, no significant differences uh, can be seen in our the phenotype of our patients. This is particularly true for the vascular involvement where renal phenomenon and nail fold uh, Capillary, capillaroscopy abnormalities are uh, show the same uh, the same prevalence uh, and also active ulceration. Uh, the, um, an important data is uh, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension because this is a link directly to the prognosis of our patients, which is a, a little bit it's reduce the frequency of these uh, serious. Uh, uh, complication of a disease in uh, pediatric patients. And uh, even if we, in pediatric practice, we do not, uh, we are not used to assess uh, with uh, um, right uh, art ca ca um, ca um, catheterization. Uh, while ELD um, involved, we are the ELD fre frequency is uh, the same in uh, is comparable between the uh, adult and juvenile patients uh, with a prevalence of 50%. 50%. There are two, two few points to, to be discussed when assessing the lung involvement in pediatric patients, as FPC alone is a poor screening test for ELD, while DLCO performs better, but it's difficult to perform in younger children. So um, usually what we do in our clinical practice is uh, we screen these patients with a baseline uh, high resolution CT scan of the lungs. Uh, when we, as already told by uh, Dr. Fuelbari, renal crisis are not uh, a concern in our patient, or still they are so rare in, in our patient that we don't not face these complications so, so often, as you can see from this, uh, uh, this slide. And at the same time, uh, a less, um, gastrointestinal involvement is less reported in, in pediatric patients compared with adult counterpart. Um, there are um, other few, few uh, differences, but what I can uh, um, summarize is it's, uh, that vascular disease and the lung disease in terms of uh, interstitial inter 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 lung disease are quite similar between adult and pediatric uh, cohort. And also the prevalence of anti-topoisomerase, anti-autoantibodies are similar as these are associated with a diffuse subtype. But when we look at the differences between pediatric and adult patients, we, uh, as, uh, as shown, uh, we have a, a higher prevalence of uh, patients with a diffuse subtype. Uh, and while uh, renal um, and uh, pulmonary hypertension and gastrointestinal involvement are more frequent in adult population. Uh, and also um, the 
anti-centromere antibodies are not so positive in our population of pediatric patients. When we look at the prognosis of these patients, we can see that uh, um, juvenile systemic sclerosis patients has a better prognosis than uh, adult uh, patients. This is a, a, a Kaplan-Meier survival curves from a recent uh, paper from the Tur uh, Turkish colleagues. But we can, uh, uh, this data is uh, comparable with uh, other um, historical court. Um, as you can see, as I already told in uh, the introduction, there is a 5% mortality in the first five years since the diagnosis. What explain uh, uh, this difference in terms of uh, survival? Um, one pediatric uh, specificity is the lack of a preventable comorbidity who might affect the prognosis of adult patients. So cancer, diabetes, smoke, uh, smoke exposure, or environmental uh, um, exposure, or hypertension. And there is also, as already, this, uh, this is, as has already been shown by also Dr. Folbari, but uh, the amazing thing for our pediatric patients is that uh, um, the survival is uh, uh, also affected by the fact that at 12 months, the uh, disease activity improves in pediatric patients. This is uh, not so true in adults where in the first three to five years since the diagnosis, uh, it's uh, um, are associated with worsening disease. And uh, these open a windows of opportunity for the treatment of our patients. So just to summarize, Juvenile systemic sclerosis is a partially distinct, distinct entity from the adult form, with higher frequency of a diffuse subtype, high prevalence of high antitopoisomerase and out antibodies, uh, and uh, um, associated with a uh, um, uh, lung involvement. So, an high resolution CT scan of the lung at the baseline is still the gold standard for diagnosis of ELD. And the, the good news is that prognosis is better than adults, but re, um, these patients require a dedicated pediatric multidisciplinary team. And uh, uh, so we need to cooperate for these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. And I am to, to answer all your questions. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And thank you so much, Ivan, for these nice lectures. We have some questions from the audience. One of the questions that we have is this topoisomerase is higher in children with uh, juvenile systemic cirrhosis. Does this persist over time? Yeah. Oh, actually, it is It is all over. It's around 30%. And actually, it's not no difference between diffuse and limited subtype. They have both this 30% and the SCL70 antibodies. Interestingly, we evaluated that, and it does re not really correlate the same organ pattern than in adults. I think actually we submitted it as an abstract recently, so it it is it is a little bit different from the prognostic value as as in adults. And when they grow up to adults, it, they keep their antibody or it disappears. So interestingly, interestingly, we have an absolute. Um, lack of knowledge of that because we have, I, I published two papers when I looked at the adult population, so juvenile onset patient in adult cohorts, the U-STAR cohort and the cohort of the Royal Free Hospital in London with Chris Denton. And in both cohorts, which is interesting that at least in the Royal Free cohort, that was better the data quality. You have a lot of patients with overlap features still. So we have around 30% overlap features in the pediatric one, and it's still in the adult royal free cohort. You had a very hard, large number of overlap patients. But interestingly, this dominance of diffuse subtype disappeared, and it were only 40% diffuse. Um, but this was looked at the patients. This patient had an age between 30 and 40. So what we don't know is it... <clears throat> kind of a survival bias that perhaps the diffuse patient died in the time between. So we don't have actual data from the pediatric cohort to the age of 30. We, we, so that is there's a real gap of knowledge. So is it a survival bias? Or what, what um, Tom Metzger authored out um, and actually Peter Merkel showed in one of the plots when he looked at all 
uh, adult systemic scleroderma trials with non-effective drugs, that if the patients survive long enough, the skin score decreases. So it can be that if, if a diffuse patient survived in the adult cohort at the age of 30, they have a limited subtype. And I think this patient, when I made this publication for 2010, I think this patient, I am not sure that they really had a good skin scoring when they were pediatric patients and we don't have any data what the skin score was when they were pediatric. So I think we don't know if it's a survival bias or perhaps a mixture of this both. Thank you so much, Ivan, for this nice reply. And what's interesting, just for the antibodies, interestingly, this limited patients had still a very low number of anti-centromere antibodies, which would fit a more to the hypothesis that these are a diffuse survivals, because they still had around 10% anti-centromere antibodies, which is not the classical adult limited subtype patients, which is much higher. Thank you so much. I have a question in the chat for Eduardo. It was asked, how often do you usually repeat HRCT in juvenile systemic cirrhosis? Uh, this is a, a I mean, uh, in, this is a, a critical issue in pediatric patients as uh, um, exposure to radiation is associated with a long-term uh, um, risk of uh, cancer in pediatric patients. So we perform uh, usually, and even can confirm, a baseline uh, high resolution CT scan of, uh, in our patients. We try to uh, monitor it over time if the first time we we try always to combine high resolution CT scan and uh, um, pulm pulmonary function test, uh, including the DLCO, to see if uh, what is the be uh, that uh, the baseline and to catch up um, to uh, just try to find out uh, any decrease in the uh, in the pulmonary function test to avoid a. Um, repetition of uh, unnecessary CT scan. Uh, but we, uh, we show in a, pub in a publication with uh, uh, Dr. Foilvari that uh, as uh, pulmonary lung function tests in children are not so uh, good. So we need to have a, a nice, um, to be aware that our patients can develop uh, uh, in the presence of a normal pulmonary function test develop an ELD. So we try to uh, make a baseline combined with uh, the lung function test and to assess regularly with a um, pulmonary function test, try to perform the uh, least number of CT scan uh, to be confident that the patients have no interstitial lung disease. Usually uh -huh. in our practice, every uh, two years, if you have a um, stable uh, values and no uh, um, and no alteration in the pulmonary function test. But even can... so, I, so, I would just add something. So, what we Eduardo quoted that we have a publication that actually a lot of patients with normal pediatric pulmonary function test values have already have beginning fibrosis on the CT. And actually, a that was shown even a totalizumab trial. It was shown that a lot of patients with normal values of pulmonary function test had beginning fibrosis. Uh, so I would put that if the family function decreases with 10 to 15%, and especially even the norm range, that is important because children can start with an FVC of 110. And if they go down to 95, they are totally normal. They won't have any complaints and they won't be dyspneic and they can run around however they wish. But even this drop in the normal range should make you more that you do a CT. And I would be not so concerned that these children would die on a radiation risk, uh, because if you don't recognize the beginning fibrosis, they will die in the fibrosis. And even the medication which are licensed for adults and is studied for children now, uh, even the tocilizumab data and all that, if you look at, they are mostly stop fibrosis and not reverse fibrosis. So for that reason, if you could stop the fibrosis at the stage when the child has a primary functional vital capacity of 90, that would be a dream for the child and not wait till it gets much lower and then you are really concerned. Mm -hmm. So so I, I would be not so concerned about this radiation. I think I would not repeat it every week, but if it's a drop in the FVC, I would repeat it. Another question concerning this topic. Um, do you also have likewise to adults mostly the NSEP pattern in children? 
Which pattern? The ANSEP pattern on HRCT, or has that not been evaluated? I actually, I think, don't think we have so much data about pediatric HRCTs yet. I think we are in the process to collecting it. I, I must be honest. So it's, I think, not currently because the inception cohort is basically, it's a low budget cohort. So we we don't we don't collect the CT pictures. Basically, the local radiologist is saying we find it is pathologic or not. And no, actually, in the updated version of the survey, we're asking more about patterns. So I think presumably we will gain more data over that. Yeah. Thank but you so much. I have this data. I have another question. Um, it's interesting that there's a low evidence of scleroderma renal crisis despite the frequent use of steroids. How much is the average dosage of steroids that is being used in juvenile systemic cirrhosis? So I think they use, because these are mostly, a lot of time, myositis patients, and they get perhaps pulse therapy with 30 milligram per kilogram, up to 1,000 milligrams, or some are getting 2 milligram per kilogram. And I think the main thing about the renal crisis is, and I think renal crisis is a kind of a several hits and what children don't have, children don't have atherosclerosis. And what you see in the cohort, that we have around 1% hypertension. I think that's what does not reflect the adult world. A lot of adults, when the patients, I think I think the mean age of adult populations in the cohorts are 50 or around. And 50 around, a lot of healthy adults have all the hypertension. And what Eduardo, Eduardo pointed out, a lot of them have already diabetes or plus two diabetes. So they all have a lot of risk factors which are already have atherosclerosis. So they already have a vessel involvement and therefore the scleroderma is a kind of a second hit and we, the children are basically healthy. And therefore I think presumably we, we don't see it. There are some children, there are children prescribed who have renal crisis. There is a patient in New York who will be submitted from Columbia Presbyterian, hopefully in the cohort. They had renal crisis, so it's not that it does not happen to children, but compared to the data, we don't see it really. So it's not a main concern. Thank you. Another question. There's lots of questions for you. Um, it's interesting that you have esophagus involvement, both in juvenile, diffuse, and limited. The question concerning this involvement is, is there also clinical dysmotility, dysmobility in juvenile system cirrhosis patients? Do they complain, for example, about dysphagia? Yes, absolutely. I think actually, I think most of our clinical colleagues, because we ask always for clinical uh, symptoms and then they do the tests. So pediatricians, I think, won't do any routine gastroscopy in a child who has no dysphagia and doesn't lose any weight. Pediatricians are more, and therefore, I think Eduardo showed the data about um, pulmonary hypertension as was a big cross under that that is assessed by ultrasound. So, um, right heart care, we know, all know that this is the gold standard to assess pulmonary hypertension. So, it's not like the pediatric cardiologists don't know that, but they are more uh, kind of cautious to do that. So, therefore, I think they would do it if you have some hints. We look at ProBNP, we look at ultrasounds, we do every six months. And I think before you start any specific treatment, you would do a right heart care. But it's not a routine screening method to do it. Thank you. Another interesting question. Are antibodies differently distributed in females and males with juvenile systemic cirrhosis? Yeah. I think male have a... Uh, male have a more severe disease course. I think we published this recently in Journal of Cladama and Related Disorders. It, the difference is not so deep where we looked. We looked at time point zero and 12 months. It's not so different as in adults, but they, you still see the differences that they have a more severe disease course. So um, they have actually, there was a significant, if we look at body mass index, under minus two and before under males had you had much more males who had that, and the and the decreased body mass index is I think an indirect reflection of the GI involvement. So they are I think we get therefore we have to get more data and more prospective long term data. But males seem to have a more severe disease. Thank you. Is there any safety data about the therapies? that you adopted from the adult world in children? 
Um, I think that's what we discussed in the consensus meeting, what we're part two, Vanessa and Eduardo. Uh, yeah. and basically the safety data we have more. So if the medication is licensed for children, most mostly we have safety data from other most common diseases. So tocilizumab is licensed for juvenile polyarthritis and systemic arthritis. So for that reason, especially polyarthritis is real, relatively common disease compared to systemic scleroderma. So you have saved the data there. Um, I think rituximab is not such a large safety data, but I think it is quite long-term used in pediatric cancers and in pediatric connective tissue diseases, and there's no signal. Um, cyclophosphamide is again, mostly used in pediatric cancer. So I think you can extrapolate safety data how far it is licensed in children. But we don't have specific safety data for systemic juvenile systemic scleroderma. Thank you so much. Um, I see no more questions in the audience. I would like to thank both of you for your very interesting talks. I would like to thank the audience for their interesting questions. And I would like to invite all who is not taking part yet of Ivan's inception cohort to contact him and to send your uh, patient's data to Ivan so we can learn more about this disease. Thank Having you. said this, I would like to thank you enormously, both of you, Ivan, Eduardo, again, the organizers, Professor Cutolo and Emanuele Gotelli, as, as well as the central coordination team in PISA. Have a nice afternoon. Well, you too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.